Hello, everyone. Welcome back to OTD Military History. <laughs> Excuse me. So today we're going to be continuing our series look at uh, books related to Canada's Battle in Normandy. The books today are downright depressing topics, but they are important topics. They both have to do with the murder of the Canadian POWs in Normandy by the 12th SS. Uh, numbers vary. Uh, the best one that I can see that comes from one of the books is 156 Canadians were murdered by the 12th SS after becoming uh, prisoners of war in Normandy starting from June 7th uh, through to almost the end of the month. Um, some of the dates are a little unknown given all kinds of circumstances. So just one thing off the beginning I wanted to say, and this is something I've had to you know, be real try hard to do, is not calling them executions. They were not executed, they were murdered. Execution has a sort of connotation or implication um, of legality, that this is somehow legal, that the 12th SS had some sort of basis in international law or the rules of war or whatever had some right to do so, <clears throat> but they never did. They never had any basis for what they did. Um, there may be people showing up during this. There may be people afterwards in the comments claiming all these kinds of things about what Canadians supposedly did. The majority of them have never been proven with no evidence whatsoever. Uh, that somehow led to be 12th SS doing what they did. Uh, by all accounts and all evidence collected, it was the uh, 12th SS that started this and finished it. They did it um, for all kinds of reasons. It depends on what you're looking at. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just a lot going on here. So the first one, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be looking at today, and I had to mark this just in case YouTube doesn't like it. There's a certain symbol under the piece of post-it there. Uh, so it's murder at the Abbey. So the story of 20 Canadian soldiers murdered at the Abbey Arden by Ian Campbell. So this is the first one I read. I don't I think it was published before the other one. Uh, yes, it was. So this was published in 96. So this book is kind of the first book length look at this topic. Now it doesn't cover those 156 I mentioned off the top. It just talks about the 20 that were murdered at the Abbey Arden, which is just west of Caen. It's pretty hard to miss um, if you're in that area. It sticks out. It's a large building still today. They fixed it up um, after the war, and it has a long history of being a, you know, an abbey for monks, and it was a family farm, and lots of people lived there over the years, and now I think it's owned by an educational company in the U.S. Not entirely sure, but you used to be able to stay there. I know that. Uh, but anyway, so this book just focuses on looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, those that were murdered at the Abbey by the 12th SS that were under the command of Kurt Meyer. Now, I've talked about Kurt Meyer a ton on the channel. There's some stuff linked down below. Uh, and if you want to look at some of this stuff afterwards, there's a quick video. And then there's a longer video live stream looking at um, the prosecution of Meyer from Taylor Coates. And then, of course, Bill Blood show about the 12th SS generally. as all linked down below. If you haven't seen those, I suggest checking them out to get some good background on this. So that's what Campbell concerns himself with here. He was a member of the Canadian forces. Uh, I think he mentions he starts in the 80s or something like that. I don't remember offhand. He was in Europe and took a trip to Normandy to check out the sites. And then, as a lot of people tend to do, stumbled on the story at the Abbey and what happened there. Um, it's an, obviously that area that's just to the west and north of Caen there is an important area for the Canadians. They're there a long time, you know, waiting to build up and, and, and push forward and take Caen and then take all that ground to the south. So they spent a lot of time there. And also this is where, of course, they push forward. Uh, the two brigades, right? Because you have the 7th Brigade landing first, and they come in. And then the 9th Brigade, which is the follow-up brigade, which a lot of the initial murders are of members of the 9th Brigade, <clears throat> along with the tank support that went with them. So it's a lot of Nova, North, North Nova Scotia Highlanders, Sherbrooke Fusiliers, and uh, a few others. And then also coming later, 
is from the uh, SDG. As two of them are murdered. Anyway, this is all available, all <coughs> easily to find. I forgot to do it, but I'll link it after. I wrote a whole article on all of this, all of these murders at all the various locations. Um, and we can get a bit more into that with the second book. But the details are a lot. And yes, it is Meyer, the tank commander, who starts off as a regimental commander within the 12th SS. And then uh, Fritz Witz is killed by uh, differing reports. Something um, takes him out at his headquarters. And so Meyer takes over. So these are happening early. So basically what Campbell does is talks about how this all develops and what this happens. As you can see here, it's, it's not a large book. So there's only so much room to move. So what he does excellently and the best part of this book to me and, and something I wish we would do more of is talk about the men who are murdered. It talks about, you know, their training, why they signed up as best as he could tell, as many details as he could get. And again, he's doing this in the 90s. Lack of digitization of stuff. He had to do all this, write people. He had the benefit of a lot of the people that who live there, like the Vico family. I'm sure many of you have heard of them. Um, they are um, very well known within the circle of Canadian military historians who look at Normandy in the Second World War because they were so willing to give, uh, you know, tours and tell people about their experiences. Two of them, the father and the son, were in the French Resistance. And, you know, they talk about that at length. The second book goes into that more as well. So he had access to that. So he, he didn't have, you know, the access, like the easy access we do today, where you could pull up the service record of all 20 of these guys very quickly. So he was able to piece this together about who they were, where they came from, you know, their families, their wives, children, what they did for work. And what is the best striking thing of all of this is they're all completely different in, in so many ways they are like a cross-section of the canadian society at the time uh, and that goes overall for the 156 as well murdered overall and there are very different backgrounds as well um so it's it, it's an excellent book at that the only problem that i'll talk about for campbell and this has nothing to do with him at all or the book is you can't find it anymore I looked all day. Um, you can't buy it new. It's out of print, apparently. Uh, I tried to find the press, the Gold Dog Press out of Ottawa. It doesn't exist anymore, as far as I can tell. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but, yeah, and I couldn't find anything on Fort Campbell, any contact, nothing like that. And I spent some time trying to do that, to try and, I don't know, talk about it in, in some way, shape, or form. So it, it, it's a good overview of what's going on on that side of the of the front, right? So we're talking about, um, I should probably have pulled up a map of, of Asi and, and Biron, the fighting that takes place over there, because that's really the first clash that takes place between the Canadians in 9th Brigade and the 12th SS. And it, it's got lots going on and talking about the fighting. So I, I like the way that it's talked about in here and the way it's laid out. Um, the next book has more detail because it's just larger, but this one talks about that, but it's also about the people, right? It's all about the people. It's, it was hard to read in, in that sense as if you get to know these people and, and obviously, you know, what's going to come, you know, what's going to happen and, and all this stuff. Like the one, particularly at the Abbey, that's one of the more, I mean, they're all heartbreaking stories. I mean, one was an orphan and he had a brother brother didn't even know he existed until he was found out about his death like it's just that's heartbreaking uh, uh, another one is george pollard project 44 has literally traced the route that the patrol he was on that, that took that led to his capture and his death apparently his mother set a dinner table for him the rest of her life waiting for him to come home because he was declared missing in action uh, there is eyewitnesses accounts of him being taken behind the lines, uh, but there was never confirmation of, of his death by finding of his body. Uh, the rest of the 19 were found on the grounds uh, of the Abbey, particularly in the garden. Um, it, it, I've been to that garden. Uh, for those of you who know this place, it's 
doesn't look like you've seen the, some of the photos of the period. Obviously, the trees are larger and it's more enclosed. Um, but it, there's a memorial there now, which is in part because of Campbell. He, he talks about really quickly in the, in the epilogue about how him and a bunch of other people got together and, and put that um, memorial together that sits in the garden today. That is the focal point of ceremonies and that I've been to. Um, I was there for an official ceremony at, at the Abbey in the garden. And there's maple trees and there's old, you know, there's poppies and Canadian maple leaf flags. And it's just, it, it, I broke down, couldn't help myself. It was just such an emotional experience. Um, this is a bit of an older photo, obviously. Can't see it so great. There's some online. Uh, but when I go there, I will be sure to get lots of photos um, for uh, this and the garden and to be able to share uh, what it looks like with everybody in film. Others have. Um, you know, but I want to get it for everybody, uh, and especially uh, members and everybody that uh, who wants them for later use or or what have you. That's going to be one of my primary goals because it's it's an accessible park that's used for uh, again memorials and ceremonies and tour groups are there frequently. I hear from people all the time. Unfortunately, they don't go to other places connected to Canada but they take groups, particularly those who might not even have asked to the Abbey, uh, because I think it it really encapsulates what was happening, what was going on, and, and, and who they were fighting, who the allies were fighting. Now, I don't know too well about the other nations, particularly towards the American sector. Some Brits are also murdered by the 12th SS. Um, we'll talk about another one of those in a minute. But that happens as well. I don't know too much of the details uh, of going on because I know the 12th SS and the SS in general, war crimes are part of their standard operating procedure. Uh, it's 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 pretty much nonstop. It, 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 you know, this is what they do. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's a good way of bringing that to light here. Um, so yeah, I'll just take questions as we come along. So are they still buried there? Or did they try to bring them home? So they're not buried at the grounds or where they were found because that's um, there was war crime investigations. Um, again, I can talk maybe about the story about that and when I'm talking about the next book. But uh, yeah, um, and, and Kevin talks about it there real quick. Uh, but Canada and the British Commonwealth do not um, repatriate. It's under the rules of the, at the time, the Imperial War Graves Commission today, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, you don't repatriate the bodies. It starts from the First World War. It was really a, a matter of practicality with all those high number of casualties. Um, so they're moved and they're centralized. So depending on when they were found and when certain uh, cemeteries were closed, uh, as Kevin said there, most were moved to Benny. That is correct. And I will, I'm will. i going to Benny. My relative is buried at Benny. I will be spending a lot of time at Benny. Um, also at Brettville sur Lays is where another is buried. And one who they thought, I don't remember off the top of my hand, there's just so many names and so many stories to keep track of. They thought he was British. They weren't sure who he was. So they took him to uh, a British cemetery, which I will also be visiting. I haven't been there before. And it's fairly not very big. Um, it was quite a ways from the Canadian sector, but it's one of those non-Canadian things I will be doing for sure and mark that. And I double checked everything and it's all good to go. So I'm going to try and get as many of the pictures of the headstones, um, all that kind of stuff. Because again, this is a tragedy and, and, and not just the 20 from the Abbey. Now, that's one of the things I want to talk about with, with Campbell's book. Again, not his fault. It's, it's, um, it's a weird criticism I've seen. And I've seen it from certain individuals, I won't say who, who have a certain proclivity to this DSS criticizing people for only talking about those murdered at the Abbey. I get it, but I also don't get it. If that's what you're going to pick on people, that's a weird thing to be picking on. Uh, it's these stories are heartbreaking. There are so many of them, 156. Some of them we don't even know. They were unidentifiable. They just know they were executed. And I used executed there. There, I say I got to stop myself. They were murdered. They were the telltale signs of being hands bound or bullet wounds to the back of the head, all of that stuff. They they had these markers of being murdered, not in battle, not anywhere near a battle, not even in the heat of battle, and their bodies were still unidentifiable. And Germans did things like running over bodies, 
that happens at Biron. Sorry, it happens at Ati, uh, where there are 37 Canadians are killed. Uh, there's the street there, which I will be highlighting and everything. So again, I'm not doing the hard nitty gritty here. I want to talk about the books, but I will be highlighting all of these things on, in a video specifically about the murders themselves, um, going to these places, trying to find the positions as best as possible, uh, all that stuff. So there's a lot of this. It's, it's a lot of, of that. It's a weird criticism to hear people say that when, yes, I understand that there is uh, others murdered and I will be visiting those as well, but those locations are also marked. And, and Phil Blood talked about those uh, on his show here, right? He went to the, the Chateau uh, Dodgery. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a weird criticism. Um, I get it, but that's a weird thing to pick on. Uh, I don't really understand it, but yeah, it's, it's really weird. Uh, sorry. I just want to read JD's uh, comment from history underground. Thanks for uh, popping in. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is an excellent question from JD uh, from history underground. If you don't know, I'm sure most of you know uh, who JD is by now. Um, yeah. So he posted uh, about what happened at the Abbey and, and did another video. I don't know if it was the same video, except for you. Anyway, I can link them after. Uh, looking at uh, like Brett Hill and Dorgus, the fighting that took place there and, and Nori and all that area. Uh, so I looked at that. So yes, so this is a really co like controversial thing. And it depends on who you ask and what source you're looking at. Um, so uh, supposedly, and this is in the second book um, by Howard Margolian, who, who talks about this, is... An officer, it was supposedly captured by an uh, officer of the 12th SS, was captured by some say British, uh, the Court of Inns Regiment, they're recce, I believe, at the time. Um, so there's this claim that they tied an officer to one of the vehicles as a human shield. This is noted through, I believe, Kurt Meyer. If I'm wrong, please let me know. Uh, it's in Margolian's book. I don't have it written down at the top of my head um, it, or written down or off the top of my head that this was supposedly done. So this was the reason why execution, sorry, murders took place and, and were taken out because somehow the rules had been broken by this um, ins, of course. Yeah, see, so there we go. I know Colin would help me, even though he's probably sleep deprived of <laughs> being an arm <laughs> Um <clears throat> Thanks for that, Colin. Yeah, ah, see, I get that always mixed up. The Brit names are, are crazy. They're so long. Uh, anyway, so that's the one I've heard. I can't remember some of them, and I think it's relayed by Kurt Meyer in his book, which I can't get my hands on because I'm not going to pay a publisher for that. I'll wait till I can get it used or something. Um, so they tied him to, I don't know if it was one of the scout cars. I'm not sure. That's the claim. And then somehow this officer or another officer got loose or got released or something and was allowed to go back to the 12th SS, basically an aid station and relay this to Kurt Meyer. However, and as, as, and yeah, there's other incidents as well. Um, they all take place afterwards. Like th it doesn't make sense. Even with Meyer's timeline, if you believe him hundred percent, which I don't believe him pretty much for anything um, because his book is just, full of lies because he was an avowed Nazi until his death. And we can talk about him in a minute, but uh, yeah. So there's all these claims that the Canadians did it first. People will come. Oh, we are getting questions about market garden. That's a little outside the scope today, Adam Steele. Maybe we can do that another time. Um, when we do AMAs all the time. So maybe we can do that. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, the timelines don't work. It doesn't make any sense, but that is so the claims. And then I have, the people that come out of the woodwork talking about, you know, how POWs were executed off the hop soon as Canadian boots touched the ground. A Juno, which is not true. I mean, I there's footage, there's photos, there's testimony from those POWs that were taken basically within the first waves of not being outright executed. Like there were thousands of them. People I have done tons of work on this as well claim that all the allies had the order, blanket order, across the AEF, the Allied Expeditionary Force, to murder any POW they came across on D-Day, on which is just not true. So people use that as an excuse. I mean, you see everything. 
it's just bonkers that people come up with this and then I ask them for evidence and then I never hear from them again. So there's this stuff. And yeah, and just quick here with what Kevin's talking about is the trial record from Kurt Meyer's trial is available. It's easily found online. It's extensive. Uh, lots of evidence went into this. Um, and we can talk about what goes on there and how Margolian's book is excellent for that part. Um, but yeah, so with Campbell's book, if you can get it, I think Norma said interlibrary loan. Most libraries should have it. I mean, it seemed to make its way across the Atlantic. Yeah, I saw it at the uh, YWM. I'm sure other museums have it. You can probably get your hands on it some way, shape, or form. Yes, um, that's the thing, too. So um, this goes for the 156. They're from across Canada, right? Like these are, we've talked about this before, regimental geographic affiliation doesn't even really hold until 44. Um, so this doesn't really take place. It, you know, it, it, they're not from one locale, so they're from all over the place. So every there's every province is covered. I think there was even a Newfoundlander was murdered in that number. Um, but yeah, so it's it, it, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, they don't need, and Chris is right, like, if you go to World War II TV or didn't listen to Phil Blood or numerous other um, historians looking at this and using the records from the Germans themselves, it, it, it comes from the standard practice of this fighting. So, you know, if from the first SS, uh, the Lieb Dan Stada, I probably said that wrong, Adolf Hitler, where the cadre of some officers and NCOs are taken over to um, start the 12th SS. So, and that's covered all well in, in Margolian's book. Uh, but yeah. Yes. So Meyer serves on the Eastern Front. He was wanted for war crimes by the Soviets. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but yes, he was definitely involved in war crimes well before coming to Normandy. Uh, and again, standard practice of the first SS, um, causing all kinds of murdering and chaos and death across the Eastern Front. It was standard practice from the get-go. It was being practiced in Poland as well. So yeah, and, and Mulke, we'll get to him in a minute. I mean, Mulke is the big one who slips through but we'll talk about that. So that said, get Campbell's book if you can. Uh, and one thing, I, I was going to read it, but I, I don't, uh, not because it's not emotional, because it's extremely emotional, uh, but I want you to get it for yourself and read it for yourself so you can take it internally because me reading it on a live stream is just not going to be the same. Um, but it's it's chapter 17. It's, it's literally at the end of the first paragraph there of why this is important to talk about and why not to stop talking about it. I mean, I'm not going to stop talking about this stuff as long as I'm doing history. Like, I'm going to be talking about what happened in Normandy to these Canadian boys who were murdered for no reason. Um, it's it's extremely powerful quote. It's one of the best I've seen, uh, generally speaking, about remembrance and commemoration, but particularly for those boys who were murdered for no reason. It's it's pretty weighty and, and a pretty hefty um, way of going about it. And this book, for sure, is is an excellent one looking at you know, from combat perspective to what happens at the Abbey and the stories of all these men. It's just, it's top notch, but unfortunately it's not accessible. And I think somebody said it was 50 pounds on Amazon in the UK or probably even equivalent in the, uh, in the EU. So the next one, and they're connected obviously, but is this is conduct unbecoming. So the story of the murder of Canadian prisoners of war in Normandy uh, by Howard Margolia. So he was a war crimes investigator for the Canadian Justice Department. So he knew what he was talking about. So he was doing this just for different things, you know, connected to stuff that Canadians were doing for like peacekeeping and I assume lots of stuff to do in the former Yugoslavia, um, all that stuff. So he doesn't really talk about that and you can find stuff on him. I tried to find a little more detail, but there's not too, too much. Um, but yeah, so he was in war crimes and, and investigator. So he really digs into this stuff. And, and I mean this in an excellent way. Like he digs the records, like he's through all of them. The citations are like a hundred something pages. Like it's uh, end noted. So you just like, it's a hundred, I can check right now. It's a lot. And, and it's, I plan on using it as much as possible for, not having to do it myself because there's just so much here. Yeah. It's almost a hundred pages literally of notes, which is, which is just wild and how well sourced this thing is. So this is good. You can get this. It's expensive. 
I think I got this fairly cheap because I was trying to do a, a postdoc and it just didn't uh, work out on this topic of trying to learn not just about the 20 from Campbell. I was trying to do what Campbell was doing for as many of the 156 as I could. It just didn't get selected for whatever reason. Um, probably hard to make it in a museum exhibit about a bunch of murdered boys, um, unfortunately. But yes, Charlie Martin talks about seeing them murdered as well. And I've talked about that book. Um, but yeah, and yeah, Colin's right. The the brutality of the SS uh, is, and the Germans generally, it's it, it's awful. And the details and some of the stuff, like Canadians being run over by trucks, POWs who are wounded on the side of the road or hit by an ambulance that purposely swerves into them and runs them over. Like, it's just, the stories are just heartbreaking. And, and, and it's just over and over and over and over again. It doesn't stop. So that's Margolian's book looks at everything as much as possible. So he starts with the formation of the 12th SS and calling them the perpetrators, which is a good way of doing it. Talks about why this exists. You know, why is there this division literally called the Hitler Youth? Like that is their name. Like it's the only other one other than the, the first SS with Hitler in their name. Why this is formed, how they go about doing it. Most of them are volunteers. Some of them are not. Some are literally conscripted in. I mean, I've had people also argue that the SS didn't conscript, which is just utterly bonkers and nonsense. Um, you know, there's just there's so many stories of these guys being forced in um, and, and misidentities and all kinds of things that go along with that. So he talks about that. Um, one thing that stuck out to me is I haven't got a chance to look into this. I, maybe I can in the future, but the, the Allied press gets wind of this because it's big news within, you know, Axis territories is calling them the baby division. That's their, one of their first nicknames. I mean, they're members of the Hitler youth. So they're fairly young. People like to present them as like 15, 16 year olds, which is not the case. Um, I think the big year of them being recruited is the birth year uh, 1926, if I'm remembering correctly. And they form in 43. So you can do the math and it doesn't make sense. And some of them are older and some are younger, yes, but they aren't like a bunch of teenagers who are in their first years of high school and things like that. So later on, and this is a nickname that gets confused and how it gets applied is they're called the murder division. They're called the murder division by other divisions of the SS and by the Wehrmacht and the Hare. So this is coming from their own people calling them this when they get this reputation right away, because this is the first instance where the 12th SS goes into combat, right? You have the veterans of the Eastern Front from the first SS who were, you know, brutally murdering civilians for years. But this is the first combat of this unit. And they automatically get the name Murder Division. That should tell you everything you need to know. These are their own people doing this. So it's, yeah, Caligula, yeah, Caligula, sorry, yeah, Little Boots. So yeah, it's it's wild. Um, and there's things, because again, this comes from the testimony and the interrogations of Meyer, because that's what Margolian relies on for this part. Um, you know, that is a, an intense part of this, is, is looking at this, because like I said before, Meyer becomes division, uh, you know, commander. So his mindset is, in, you know, seen to be carrying across the division. He's I mean, I don't like to compare a parable. There's another guy who seems to be the worst by a lot. Meyer is no Boy Scout even remotely at all. And this guy seems like a straight up just psychopath um, who doesn't get anything. Uh, but anyway, so they, they they indoctrinate them. They use propaganda. It's involved from the beginning of their training. They do things like live fire exercises right away. There's They die in training. So these guys are trained in this way. They're told, you know, remember, you're getting bombed at home. These guys are war criminals. We have to go kill them all. You know, it's it's like that. It, it, and, you know, Kurt Meyer said, you know, famously for saying, we're going to throw these little fishes back into the sea, which they clearly do not do. You know, how they stop the counterattack, pretty much dead cold. Uh, and, but then that's when the murdering starts. So one thing I noticed, and it's a minor aside, and it's, it's not a big deal, because um, the rest of this book, Margolian's, is excellent. It's dumb, but I, academic historian can't stop myself. Is one thing that's mentioned in here. So my overall point from this will be 
it's good for the nitty gritty. Don't rely on the bigger stuff. Is Margolian re takes the myth of Polish lancers attacking German tanks as fact when we know that that's not true. You know, so like that was one of the things that caught me off, kind of off guard. Is that was thrown in there, not particularly cited well, so it was a bit confusing. So other than that, like the nitty gritty, like everything else, good to go. The bigger war stuff, not so much. So that's just an aside. The rest of it is excellent. So he covers it basically area by area. So like I've written down, like he does Ati and Biron together because that's just how the fighting developed. And then Puto, which is further to the west. And then Brettville, which I talked about before. And then I think it was Norma who brought up um, Charlie Martin from the Queen's Zone who was part of the attack at, at Le Miseneau Patry. He talks about those guys that are murdered there too. Uh, he covers them all. So he covers the battle and then he covers those who are murdered and done very, very well. So that's the big thing for me is, is what's going on here. And he takes some, you know, as historians tend to do, some conclusions that you can't really support necessarily directly about why these first killings take place. Because um, he starts with what happens at Ati, is they took a high number of casualties to take these positions that are just held by a platoon of a company. And they take high number of casualties. It's not quite clear because the battlefield switches hands in that area multiple times. Um, and lots going on in other places. But he thinks because, you know, these guys have been pumped up since they entered service, even before that, right, as being part of the Hitler Youth, that they're the best. They're the elite, you know, that dirty word. Um, you know, that they've been told they're the greatest. You know, it's... And all of a sudden, you, your first taste of warfare, half your buddies are now dead. They just lost it. Um, I believe that to some degree. I think the indoctrination is part of this. There's, you know, uh, other stuff about, you know, who lets this go and, you know, officers supposedly stopping it and all that kind of stuff. Details are confused because we just know from some eyewitness accounts, particularly from civilians in places like Ati and, and Biron, who lived through it and uh, ended up testifying and things like that um, of what happened, right? And, and one thing that is interesting and a detail I forgot is Again, about this SS eliteness and all this stuff that I keep railing about, but it's for a specific reason. Because if you keep saying these terrible, terrible units are elite and they're the best, um, people are going to think it's true and that they were somehow better and all of this stuff. And then we just focus on that instead of focusing on the murders and the war crimes. And that's not what I like because that is the wrong focus. We should be focusing on what the nastiness has happened and also how the Canadians, how long are we into this broadcast? Kick their ass multiple times. Every SS, 12th SS attack other than Ati, and they still stop them. They don't take their objectives. They just take Ati and Viron, which was only held by a handful of troops. They still get stopped further north. Counterattack fails with high casualties. Canadians kick their ass every time. So what elite is this bullshit? I'm sorry, it just drives me nuts. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just seeing recommendations. Yeah, and Colin talking about going to, I think it was the school. Sorry. Uh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, um, yeah, that would have been a weird experience. And, and Phil talked about it uh, a bit on the on the talk of, about uh, the 12th SS and with some pictures from the school. Um, but yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, anyway, yeah, so, so that is um, a good part of Margolian's book. Um, just want to see what else here. Yeah, so that's... Um, the conclusion he reaches based on his evidence. Uh, and then there's things like um, Meyer's claims, right? Kurt Meyer, not Herbert Meyer, who was part of the 12th SS, who wrote the quote-unquote official history of the unit afterwards. Um, Kurt Meyer wrote his book, Grenadiers. It was famously sold thousands of copies. Anyway, still on sale today, still in print. Um, most of it to me, based on what, yeah, sorry, yeah, Hell's Corner. I couldn't remember the top of my name. Get the map in my head, Colin, I'm sure as you do as well. And I just, I know what it is, location, but I forget the name. Because <laughs> there's so many names flying through my head trying to keep these, what, three fronts, two in a bit, uh, straight. Anyway, yeah, so it, it, Hell's Corners, there's a memorial there as well for the ninth Brigade, which I will be going to. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, that side that's connected to the Abbey and what goes on there. And he... And Margolian goes into detail 
probably going to say it wrong, about the key witness for the Meyer trial. His name is uh, Ian Jesenik, Jesuit, I think. Uh, he is a Pole by nationality, right? but he's an ethnic German. So he's working in a factory. Uh, and this is why we know that all the 12th SS is not these super enthused elite, supposedly volunteers. Uh, yeah, that's true, Colin, you live there. It might make things easier. <laughs> I feel like I need to know this stuff. Well, I'm Pat. Uh, anyway. Um, sorry. Yes, I think, and Norma just asked, I think you can, uh, Woody and, and Mag did some stuff from there. I remember Hell's Corners, so probably. Um, so anyway, sorry, uh, Jessenick talks about how he was working in a factory. The 12th SS came, well, you know, the SS came in and said, we're recruiting. And nobody was really keen to do it. Um, so they told him, okay, you're going anyway. And they got a conscription notice in the mail and was sent off to train in Belgium. So by no means did he volunteer. He does fight with them. He does get wounded. He eventually deserts. I guess you can call it deserts. He just surrenders at one point. And then, then he's going through. He's captured by Americans. Uh, and then he's going through the process. And they have someone who speaks German to get the stories. And he tells them what he saw. So he's at the Abbey while these murders are taking place. And again, these are lots of um, uh, uh, details. There's lots of misunderstandings. You know, Justin uh, gives under oath that he doesn't hear Meyer give the order to execute them. But he hears Meyer saying, stop taking prisoners. He heard earlier from all over on, you know, stop doing that. We don't want prisoners, that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden there's gunshots and then there's dead bodies because he went into the garden of uh, the Abbey and saw the dead bodies. So he's a key witness in all of this. Uh, Margolian does an excellent job talking about the trial. So I really recommend it uh, for that perspective. And there's links down below to get Margolian's book from Amazon. Uh, affiliate links that do help me. Um, um, with the channel. Um, but anyway, it's an excellent book. Get a library, whatever. Beg, borrow, steal. <laughs> it, it's an excellent book from that regard. It, it's almost like a war crimes investigator is doing this, but backwards as a historian. It, it's fantastic in that way. But the stories, again, I'm warning you multiple times are heartbreaking and they don't stop. And they're heartbreaking stories and then you get angry at the end. So that's kind of what I want to talk about next is he talks about the murders at places like, um, uh, again, I'm terrible with pronunciations, but the Chateau d'Audry, which is now a luxury hotel. It was used as the headquarters for them. Um, so yeah, it's it, for one of the units, a bunch of executions take place there. They're brutal. Uh, one of the characters, and I've brought this up on social media before, is, is um, Monke. He's also a regimental commander at the same time. Um, time uh same sorry same level as meyer he is probably one of the worst he's linked to war crimes all the way back to 1940 uh with the british murders at um where how did where how did sorry if i'm saying that incorrect um outside dunkirk where a bunch of french and british pow's are murdered straight up by the ss this pattern continues and he does this basically wherever he goes um it's documented multiple times. He'll come across a field of POWs, try to interrogate a few of them. Doesn't speak English, only speaks German. Blow a gasket and order them all executed. And Margolian goes into the details of these things. Some of them, like, and this is the thing that gets me is this, again, we can maybe talk about that later, but the supposed eliteness, these, these SS troops are told to execute these men, particularly at the Chateau, tell them to turn around. They can't face them. They won't face the people they're about to execute. Um, so like that sticks out to me. And one thing I forgot to mention the Abbey is the handshaking. Like they, they were in interrogated. So yeah, I guess I should talk about this before because this is another heartbreaking part of the story. And what I'll be telling on the ground itself in better detail is 10, they're asking these men that have been rounded up from the various units outside of of Khan and, and the area outside the Abbey there are brought into this area. Um, Wormhouten. Yeah, I can never pronounce these names. It drives me nuts. I gotta get better at this stuff. Um, they round them up and they put them in this area. They ask for 10 volunteers. Nobody puts up their hand because they know where this is going. So they just select them at seemingly random. No one can give a reason why they're selected. Um, 
they're interrogated. They give up nothing. And it's not like they would have known much anyway, especially with things changing at the time. Um, but they realize eventually what's happening. They're called out to the garden where they hear gunshot. So eventually the men start just shaking each other's hands when they, their name is called and they know what's going to happen. And they walk up the stairs and then they walk out into the garden and then they're shot. So that is 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 another heartbreaking story uh, connected to this. And it's it's um, these books are full of it. So like there's the murders at the Chateau, outside the Chateau. There's murders outside Brettville. There's murders in Nori. There's murders uh, at, at um, uh, yeah, that is Like they don't stop. Right. And then there's the one from the, the SDG Highlanders is the last big one. The one I talked about with George Pollard. So that is covered in detail very well. Um, but yeah, the one thing I wanted to talk about in this um, is, is Monke. So he continues to fight on. He fights to the end, basically, literally in, in, in Berlin after carrying out all these murders. He's captured by the Soviets. The Soviets deny they ever took him prisoner because already the alliance is falling apart. Yeah, there's so many. Like it's there's murders all over the place, and I'm sure there's ones we don't even know about. Um, there's been ones we'll never know about. Um, anyway, so I can get some questions in a second, but um, when I get back to to, to Monke here, so he's captured. The Soviets deny that they even have him. Uh, Margolian talks about it in the book a little bit of. A little bit of back and forth that's going on basically between the Canadians, sort of with the Brits and the Soviets, about swapping Meyer for Monke. Because, I mean, the, the Meyer is known for crimes in the, in the East. There's the whole trial with Meyer, which is talked about in those other videos if you want to check those out. Um, and again, Martin Wayne talks about these to the uh, nth degree in a good way. Um, get to that in a second. But um, it's 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 maddening that he is not, and then he's released from POW, as a POW by the Soviets. The Germans supposedly look into um, the West Germans look into his supposed crimes. Don't have enough evidence. Don't do anything about it. And what well, we'll talk about why the Canadians don't do anything in a second is the whole thing falls apart. So Monkey dies in two thousand one, an old man who is basically a murdering psychopath Nazi. Sees no at all you don't even see the inside of a courtroom because they just can't be bothered in most cases so that's another thing we're going to talk about is what happened so what happens in the war crime area there's a bit of back and forth at the beginning there where how these things are done within 21st army group a bit confusing we're going to explain it better than i can right now um, so what eventually happens within shafe so the supreme headquarters led by eisenhower sets up the war crimes division to look into this stuff. Uh, and that's where it starts. You have Bruce McDonald, who we talked about with Taylor Coates a while back, I think for last year, for um, uh, Normandy stuff. He leads the Canadian part of this. Uh, that goes on for a while. They start collecting evidence with the support of Shafe behind it, those resources, like literally like clerks and trucks and all that stuff that it takes to do this. Uh, eventually that is broken up because I don't know if it's speculation or confirmed. I don't know. I don't want to say for sure because I haven't seen the documents, but because of what happens at Melbourne, again, with our best friends here, the 12th, you know, the SS and how their shitbagginess under, you know, Joaquin Piper with Melbourne and then the executions that take the murdering that takes place there. The U S army wants to do it themselves. Right. And, and they break off so the shape war crimes unit falls apart. Canadians, reluctantly set up their own, kind of under-resourced. Um, so they get Meyer. So they have Meyer because he's captured in um, uh, Belgium. So they have him. They have him. He's not in the East. They got him. So they can bring him to trial, and they do. It's very well known, right? He's found guilty, um, you know, of all of this. Of Some of the charges, some of them are dropped because they can't confirm it was his unit's. Uh, that were doing some of the murdering at Ati and Biron. Whatever. They get him. They charge him. Find him guilty. Sentence him to death to be shot. So what is really interesting that Margolian is able to do here is he breaks down how this goes. Canada doesn't have any rules on war crimes for others. 
it has rules on what to do if a Canadian soldier, you know, commits war crimes. It doesn't have its own rules for what happens to someone who commits war crimes against Canadians. So they are just making this up as they go along. Very ad hoc, very quickly. So Bruce McDonald, who is a central figure in all of this, writes this. What he does is he writes in a review. So the the uh, the, uh, the verdict of, of death by sh- a shooting has to be reviewed. And that is Chris Folks. So it has two reviews. So there's one that has to get the rubber stamp. Folks, who's I'm not a big fan of him for all kinds of reasons. Um, he okays it. Um, he, he he okays the, the sentence and it's carried out. Uh, however, they wrote in, McDonald wrote in, bump up to another level. It had to go to the theater commander. And, you know, um, the, it's also Chris Folks. So again, Mergolian, and it does a better job of explaining all this in detail. This is hard to explain in a video or in a live stream. He has, looks at it again and all of a sudden he changes his mind. And this execution has stayed. He is given life imprisonment in Canada. So he's shipped off to Canada to Dorchester, New Brunswick. Only serves, I think it's eight years in Canada, maybe nine. Can't remember off the top of my head. So, and I can see the chat in the sidebar about the Cold War. So West Germany, right, of the three Western allies, occupation zones come together. We want them in NATO. We want them on the front line of the possibly coming hot war with the Soviet. One of the conditions that the West Germans give for even joining NATO and doing all of this cooperation is release the war criminals or bring them home at least. So Meyer is brought to West Germany to a British run prison and he is eventually just released, supposedly for health reasons. He lives a little bit longer and dies of a heart attack. Uh, ends up being a beer salesman, ends up selling beer to Canadians. It's in a Canadian mess in Germany. It's it's a whole thing. They should have just shot him and been done with it. But this goes on and on and on. Yeah, I mean, I well, I don't know. I don't know about that, Norma. I mean, I've read the, the autobiography. I have it. I took photos on my photos on my phone of his justification. He thought nobody was going to remember this. He literally says that. Like, oh, no one's going to be talking about this anyway. And he was clearly wrong. I don't think he was the brightest bulb. Um, I think he was way out of his depth beyond being a battalion commander, to be honest. So him making these kind of decisions is is something he shouldn't have been given. Uh, but he also gives it as justification of, of wanting to uh, have this um, going on. So it's 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 complicated. But he says the West German thing basically has his or the Germans eventually. I guess he doesn't know this in forty five of what's going to happen. So eventually, and then Meyer's just released to West Germany. And as Phil Blood talked about, he does all that stuff. And um, he, his funeral, the thing is, and JD just brings up a good way of segueing into this actually is because Joachim Piper, right? His, he lives in France of all places, Piper, not Meyer. So Piper basically gets off because the German, the U S army lets him get off. Basically he ends up moving to France and then is killed in his home by people who recognized him. And then, you know, they burn him. Well, they shoot him pretty much confirmed and then burn his house down on Bastille Day. So, so why that doesn't happen to Meyer, he goes to West Germany, stays in West Germany, doesn't really make the rounds. He's a popular guy. Uh, he's an apologist for the, for the SS generally. Um, you know, a group is set up by these veterans of saying they were just soldiers, they were like anybody else. Uh, it's, he and he dies young because he was not in the best shape. So anyway, yeah, so it's yeah, that was unlikely. And most of these other guys, like there's the characters in this book, uh, not characters, the individuals of these units, they all live to be older. They don't get charged. They don't get to be one minute in a jail cell. They get nothing because the Canadian war crime unit closes up shop effectively early after the Meyer conviction and it goes nowhere and they don't bring it up again. I saw a question about, um, yeah, about Mulke. They tried, um, they couldn't find anything. They wanted the German West Germans to do it. The West Germans 
I don't know if they tried hard or not. I don't know. There's internal politics of West Germany as well at the time. So, and this is in 60 something, 60, 60, maybe late fifties. I'm not too sure. Um, yeah. So there's a big part of that. So they try to get the Germans to do it and then they don't do anything about it. And they tried it later as well and nothing happens. Um, and, and, and this book is written at the end of the 20th century. So the nineties and it's updated about all that stuff. Uh, actually, I think when this book is published, Monke is still alive because he talks about him in the present tense. So that's the big one for me is the Monke stuff, getting away with it. Um, um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, you, well, you can't put in everyone in prison, can you? Well, this isn't a lot of people. Um, it's really not a lot of people. It, it's a handful of commanders. Uh, I'm not talking about whole units here. I'm talking about those. And, responsibility yeah so that's it um lots of stuff in here only one ss commander 12th ss commander is convicted and executed for his crimes uh, for the murder of a soldier from the queen's own rifles uh, after uh let mizanel patry uh sabikin i don't know if i'm saying Berthard sabikin is the only one right Meyer escapes the firing squad. He's the only one that is executed for his crimes. One. So. And that's how Margolin ends the book, is talking about kind of that rant I just went on, about how this is a failure of justice. These guys are not brought to trial in any way, shape, or form, aren't given anything. So it's a lot going on here. So it's 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 a frustrating, that's I mean, it's, you're, you're you know, it's, it's sad and it's heartbreaking. And then you're by the end, you're pissed because of this lack of will by the Canadian government, the Canadian military to do anything about it. So it's, it's quite annoying. So if you guys have questions, please fire away. Um, I'm going to try and go back here. I knew there were some, so if you have to repost them, please do. Um, just trying to find, cause you guys have been answering in the sidebar. Cause you guys are awesome. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of the ones I saw. Sorry. Just one second. Uh, so that's part of it. I mean, sometimes they don't get all the kit, but they have like distinctive kit, that smock, that's the, the, the camouflage smock. That's distinctive. Um, some of the things like the tanks, yes, they get better, particularly in Normandy, uh, but they're just straight up told that they're elite. I, I found a document that was from German propaganda from captured documents saying, telling them that they are elite. Even before they get into combat, you are the best because you've come through the Hitler Youth, blah, 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 whatever. So it, it's their own propaganda. So when I see this SS as elite, particularly the SS units in Normandy, uh, I hate the term. I've saw some other people talking about it. I hate that it's used. It shouldn't be used ever by anyone for anything. I hate it. Um, because even things like special forces, they're trained to do special things. doesn't mean they're elite because that can mean a whole bunch of things. I just hate the use of the term. I'm not saying you. Uh, Medi, I'm not mad at you, but I'm just generally in the field. It's a word we should no longer use. Yeah, and it's Colin said he hates it too. Yeah, it's it's awful. So, and I know this has been answered a little bit in the sidebar, but I can talk about this real brief. Is what part? Uh, why was this part of the history of the SS not focused more on after the war during the Cold War period? And it's basically the Cold War context. We've talked about this before. Um, is we need help to fight the Soviets. So why not use the people who were fighting them most re recently and a long time? And I mean, the flaw in that thinking to me is, is they lost. The Germans lost very badly to the Soviets. So should we really be taking lessons from them? Maybe do the opposite of what they did. Um, but yeah, so there's the things like getting West Germany into NATO and People literally being like, we're done with this. We don't want to deal with this anymore. Uh, and then you have, and then, then I've talked about this as well with um, with Michael Whitman and how this sort of takes hold, particularly in the U.S. Army, of, of how the SS are this great force and we can learn so much from them and they aren't so bad and they're great and they were daring and dashing. And I'm like, yeah, when they're not murdering a bunch of people. That's the thing they're best at is murdering unarmed civilians. Uh, not really fighting wars. Case in point about the losing. 
Um, so yeah, so that's part of it. And it is, the bus just get focused on just not the crime part. And I see people who are now fed up with it and don't online today saying, why do we always have to talk about the war crimes? Like, cause it's bad. So it, it's hidden away for that reason. And then of course the allied governments get their hands dirty by doing these things and not carrying out the proper executions. So. Yeah, so Scott's here, bulwark against communism. Yeah, uh, they did. James is right here. The West Germans had a whole unit looking into this, and they got a bunch of people. Um, yeah. And there's this, too. A lot of them got working in places, working with them, um, because they want to use them for their knowledge, supposedly. Uh, a lot of hearsay, a lot of unconfirmed stuff, but there's a lot of that going on. Uh, particularly right after, because again, everyone's um, scared shitless of the Soviets, basically. Yes, <laughs> that's part of it, definitely part of it, 100%. Uh, so the, yeah, I, I mentioned this briefly, uh, Yuang, they did, uh, it just went nowhere. Um, they couldn't get their hands on them, they weren't going to extradite them without evidence. So, they, and the Canadian government wasn't interested in it. Uh, Canadian government is not interested really at all, period speaking. And this goes beyond the Second World War of trying war criminals. Canada has a horrible history of letting people who've committed horrible crimes come to our country and get away with it, live here peacefully, die in their beds. And I'm not even talking about the Second World War, I'm talking other places like former Yugoslavia. Tons of them came here. It's just something that the Canadian government doesn't want to touch. And it just keeps getting worse. It's none of these things that the Canadian government thinks is just going to go away, but they just keep doing it. It came up again recently with the gentleman in the House of Commons getting applauded when he served with the 14th SS. Um, Yaroslav Hunka getting a standing ovation in the House of Commons. And I'm not saying he committed war crimes individually, but it's still bad. So it's things like that. So it's, yeah. Sorry, I'm just reading Kevin's question here. Did Vokes and others err by conflating heat of battle murders happen in all armies and thus implicate them in murders after removing prisoners in time and place to HQs? Yes, I do believe so. I believe that that's what Vokes was talking about. Um, heat of battle things and, and, and you know, guys coming up on a foxhole or a slip trench and can't see so good and the guy's got his hands up and you don't know that and you pop him one or you bayonet him and that happens or, you know, the, that happens all the time. Um, happens first world war it's happened since the invention of warfare i think volks conflates that with what's going on behind the scenes and then throw all the political stuff on top again norm has been talking about how he's not that bright he's trying to conflate a bunch of stuff trying to understand situations i don't think he can understand and he's in charge because everybody else was gone through and out so they left him in charge because everybody wanted to go home and he was not the man to do it Sorry, I'm just going through here. No, the Wehrmacht was dirty as the rest. Um, they were just as bad. Um, yeah, I mean, they're bad. I mean, even the Luftwaffe does it, right? Phil Blood talks about that in his book, Birds of Prey. It's a fantastic book, and the research he did and everything. It's, it's, it's great, the work he's did. Um, but yeah, like even the supposed Air Force is killing people, civilians. So it's, they're all bad. Yes, I get a Piper wasn't there, but it's still his command. And personally, I believe it's under your command and it happens if you're responsible and you should bear responsibility for that, come what may. Um, and I mean that good or bad. Okay, sorry, I'm just working my way through here. Um, I mean, yeah, it, we can speculate, um, but I do think it's pathetic. I mean, I've talked about this again. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, we need them on our side. We need these things, you know, this rabid anti-communism that took hold. I mean, obviously it has its roots before the war, but it, it had such a strong hold that it blinded to everything else. You know, these, these damn commies are coming for us. We have to do everything we can to stop them. And it just blinded everybody to everything else that had been happening before. And then and I've said this, and I will say it again. 
it lets all these Nazis slip through the cracks. And for reasons that I guess, of course, yes, this is with hindsight, never needed it. And I still don't believe it would have helped regardless anyway. So, I mean, the whole thing and things like staff rides and looking at Goodwood and thinking that's what the Soviets are going to do, like they did there and just don't buy it. It's just doesn't, doesn't compete to me. Maybe people thought that at the time, but it, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a bad justification for this kind of stuff. Yes, he was actually, because the Canadian unit had shut down and the cases were transferred to the British war crime unit. So he was executed after the fact. So Myers was first. They shut the whole thing down basically after Meyer into 46 and the Brits take over. And, and Sabikin is one of those who the Brits get. Oh, thank you for watching, Reddy. I appreciate it. How comparable was this to the Japanese war crimes? Oh, geez. Um, oh, God. Um, they're different, right? Like, you have what happens in mainland China, which is just outright brutality. And we know things like Nan uh, Nan Nanjing and all that stuff. And what they're doing even before they launch the war. In, uh... Oh, thanks for coming out, Colin. I know I probably missed you, but uh, thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. I know it's super late for you. So thank you. And anybody else who's watching from Europe. Um, so sorry. Yeah. So what goes on in, in mainland China is absolutely brutal. It's, it, they're very different, right? And then you have, you know, the killings of POWs in the POW camps by the Japanese that goes on for years. I mean, you have extra, right, you know, murders too by the Japanese the POWs have just been captured and happens in Hong Kong, happens in pretty much everywhere. Um, so it's, it's a little different because the Japanese keep killing on huge levels, right? Um, particularly in camp in combat, the 12th SS eventually do stop killing POWs as far as we know, because they start losing. <laughs> So they they start not doing so good and they they stop all this. So because they can't keep fighting the way they're fighting, and they just don't take as many POWs because we stop offensives and hold on. Not we, the Canadians and the Allied armies. So it, it's it's hard to compare them. They're they're two different, whole different piles of horribleness. I keep trying to tell people online, especially it's you don't have to rank the horribleness. They can both be horrible at the same time. So it's hard to compare because of, of what you're looking at. And then you have higher survival rates in German POW camps than you do in Japanese and, and all of that stuff. Motivations are different. Conditions are different. Um, method of murder is different. It's just, it's a hard one to combine. And I know I've done both, but it's, it, it, it's probably an area that's good to be looked at, but maybe like in the responses and stuff, but it's just so much horrible. It's just a pile of horrible and it's hard to cut through. Uh, no, not as far as I know um, to this. Um, not really. Um, it's, it's hard, right? At the time, you don't know what's going on. Details eventually trickle out. Families don't sometimes learn until well after the war. Um, at the time, people are not, you know, having access to information like we do today. I'm not saying this is where you're coming from, but I'm trying to think about this out loud. So, and, and organizing is much more difficult at the time, right? You can't just, hey, Twitter, let's hang out. You know, These families don't know each other. They're from all over the country. So there's no real organization. They're a small chunk, right? I mean, overall in the Canadian military of a million people in the Second World War, all this, these families, right, only equals a couple hundred people max, if that. So it's hard to organize in that respect. To do anything about it. I mean, there was protests in public, like there's protests on Parliament Hill when Meyer was released. There's photos of it. It's it's pretty wild. Um, they like had an effigy of him. They were burning, I think, or they hung him. I can't remember. They did something like that. Uh, but no, as far as I can tell, the families weren't really interested in that. Some of them, like I said, were just heartbroken. Um, some didn't understand what had happened. They didn't understand what that meant. Um, don't blame them, right? This is not common. Um, particularly Canada at the time, right? It's, there's POWs is, is few and far between until really until 43. So they don't, it's hard to wrap your head around. And then after the war, when you're wracked with grief, I mean, it seemingly kills some of these parents um, and die soon afterwards, um, not even make it to the 1950s uh, after learning of the death of their, their sons. So it, they didn't really do much. And it, it was hard to pressure the government at the time to do anything really, to be honest. At least that's my opinion.
Yeah, James, yeah. I mean, yes. I think that's, uh, yes, and hit the like button. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think that is definitely part of it. And I think we still see this today. Because um, certain people will study certain units that got that lost certain battles to the you know SS units. So they try to pump them up to be better than they were. And like, just take the defeat. We ended up winning in the long run. That's what's more important than fighting for reputations 80 years later. Um, so yeah, they're definitely pumping them up. I think this happens a lot, particularly in official circles, particularly in the United States and Britain, um, with some of the leaders that German leaders kind of cling to them. And yes, it's good to have their knowledge about what happened. But again, some of them are notorious liars. So what can you believe? Uh, you know, doing the things like the staff rides in Normandy and things like that. And, you know, they're pumping their own selves up, make themselves look better. And then, of course, you're going to believe them and you want to if you've lost to them at certain points, you want to make yourself look better. Like, oh yeah, these are the greatest guys of all time, but we beat them, right? So I think there's a lot of that going on and I still see it today. And I don't, it's unfortunate and it makes no sense to me. And I don't get it 80 years later, three generations removed, because I know some people who have done this and they're around my age. So I don't really get it. Yeah, there's no indication. Um, there's, you know, knowledge of their MIA and then they're told of their deaths and like, you know, where they're buried and that kind of thing. Um, but again, yeah, um, Margolin talks about that as well. It's part of the book. Yeah, I mean, that's what really gets me going. Um, uh, is about the level of evil and what's done and who gets punished for it. Um, yeah, it's it, it's upsetting. Very, and this is a fair question, James. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want any of this ever. War is awful, it's the worst thing we do to each other. It's something we shouldn't be doing. Um, we should be prepared to defend ourselves, but not take wars of aggression. Um, that's my belief, but that's just my personal belief. It, it, it's, it's, and this is might sound like an excuse, but it's just so exhausting dealing with violence all day and then seeing it on the news all the time in organized state fashions. It's, it's exhausting. There's so much death and it's, it's a lot for me personally. Um, to, I used to be really involved in the news. Now I don't really read it at all. Um, just cause it just drains my mental health. Um, I just have a struggle with it, but yeah, wars and all of it is heartbreaking for me. I don't want any of this. I say this about everything related to anything, social policies, economics. Just let people live their lives and leave them alone. That's what I believe. Um, we should all just get along and hang out and have fun. Why we have to be so violent towards each other. I know why we do it. I don't like it, but I just leave people be. That's how I believe personally, but it's heartbreaking, and it just continues on, and it's, it's so heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right, Ghost Wheel here, part of that. Oh, and thanks for becoming a member. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I saw another question. Let's get to it in a second. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely some of that. It's it, it's a lot to just, also, they're tired of it, Canadian government especially. They just don't want to deal with it. It's not worth it. Um, it's, it's, again, like a small number. So why bother? The country's trying to focus on something else. The government of King was not a foreign policy directed government to begin with. So trying to execute citizens of other countries is not something in his wheelhouse. He doesn't even like really looking beyond the shores of Canada to begin with. So doing something like this is definitely not something he's going to push. And then he retires and then people move on. So meeting of the generals. So I haven't, um, I haven't read it. I'll be honest. I have it on my shelf because I got it cheap years ago. I used it a little bit for things like looking at stuff. As far as I can tell, it's not good because Foster, the author, hate, hated his father, who is Harry Foster, who's in charge of the trial, right? He's the president of the trial. So, of course, this takes on a weird dimension, right? This book is gigantic. You can see it back there, Meeting of the Generals, um, just over my right shoulder. <laughs> um, as far as I can tell, and this is from top-notch Canadian military historians. So... Uh, I will dig into it one day. It's just I've heard so bad things, and it's so wrought with BS and 
justifying stuff and justifying war crimes. It's just another one of those draining things. Yeah, I mean, the anti-communism just made people dumbstruck. I mean, again, yeah, that, yeah, definitely allowed to have that opinion. But I mean, just the scale of death um, is massive. And they're both murdering with impunity over and over and over again. And it just doesn't stop. So, I mean, I don't, one's not worse than the other to me. It's just bad. Bad is bad. We don't need degrees of bad. It's just bad. Uh, a, a little bit. So, I mean, that's kind of what, um, again, Campbell does, but it's hard to get your hands on this thing. A little bit, right? Because it's it, it's hard to get these details. Because Campbell's writing in the 90s. A lot of people have passed on. You only can, you know, talk to, a, you know, the daughter or the sister or whatever, right? So it's hard to get a lot of those details. People weren't looking into this at the time. There's a few articles, basically about Meyer and what's going on in Germany, but nobody's looking at what goes on here. And I'm talking about the time and journalism and things like that. So there's not much left. And it was never really a big area of study. And this is one of the biggest failings of military history, in my opinion, but it's a bit of a tangent, but the families don't get talked about. Who are, you know, left don't get talked about. I mean, we should talk about the dead. Obviously, I believe that. That's what I do. And I do do this. But we don't talk about those who are left, the families. What happened to them? The thing I see in the files a lot, because I look at a lot of service files for all kinds of things, is things called like the war gratuity, war service gratuity, where, you know, part of the paycheck was sent home to the family. Uh, things like war bonds. The families who have now lost somebody, sometimes a father and a breadwinner, or a partial breadwinner, whatever. Sometimes the parents were relying on children, their adult children, um, for all kinds of reasons. And they need every dollar they can get. So that was their focus. I mean, that's just what's in the file. Some other files I've, I've seen, people are mad that their you know child is dead. Um, those don't tend to be in the files as much. It's, it's mostly about, can we get this money? Because um, we owed it because they, you know, the soldier willed it to them or the airmen or whatever. So I see that a lot, and, and and that's what I see. So and there's not very much literature literature on this, and it's unfortunate. I mean, for this war, those days are gone. We can't do anything about it, but it's something to look forward moving forward in the field. So it's talked about a little bit, but not much because there's just not much to go on. So. Um, yeah, so that's not really touched on in these books. It's touched on a little bit. But those are some of the trials that are done. It's again done under the British. Uh, later it is the murder of um, RCAF flyers in different places. Just a few of them. I'm not sure how many are, are brought to trial, but it's a few. So I, I would assume that this happened out. Yeah, it's in the Vosges. That one in particular. There's one in the Netherlands, one in Belgium, because um, it's stuff like that, right? Um, yeah, so I'm sure it's happened um, multiple times. I mean, details are sketchy when these planes went down because I do lots of work on the Air Force, particularly recently. I see this stuff, so it's it's it, it, it's definitely something I wouldn't put out of the realm of possibility. Happening way more than we could possibly know, especially today. Yeah, yeah, can turn ordinary people into monsters or let monsters be terrible. Um, is also a lesson I like to take from this. Um, but yeah, very well said, Norma. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's other work I know for sure, James. Yeah, lots of work being done on this. And, and oh, it's not out yet. Okay. Um, something I'll keep an eye on. But uh, probably, yeah, Intel plays a role in this. Uh, the coming supposed clash with the Soviets, right, is, is the overarching thing here. But uh, yeah. Oh, thank you, James. I know it's it's tough, right? To, to, as a historian, you focus on the past and what I do every day, and um, and then the, the news and how things are getting worse, and it's just it's so difficult sometimes. Yeah, it happens frequently. I mean, the murdering and the prosecutions. There was a, quite a number of them, but this is the Normandy focus. So maybe down the road, that's something I can definitely look at because it happened. I mean, Canadians were sent to. Mauthausen, Dachau, something like that. They were sent to one of the concentration camps. Um, 
after being shot down. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's 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 something to, to keep in mind. Um, but uh, it, it makes sense, right? When you you don't have anything, something. Well, you don't have the grave. The grave is overseas. You probably will never see it. A lot of these families are not have means to do so. Um, so what do you have, right? And you're owed the money. The government owes it to you anyway. Um, and that's just the file. That's just what's kept in the file. The stuff may have got chucked. Stuff may have whatever. I don't know. Because um, every file is different. I think I was talking to Norma. Yeah, I was talking to Norma about this day if she's still watching. Like how every file is different. There is no rhyme or reason to any of this stuff. It's not organized in any way, shape, or form. And so what we're missing, who knows? No, I keep I should watch this. I'll watch it before I go. I've heard mixed things. Um I'm just not the biggest it sounds bad as a YouTuber. I'm just not the biggest fan of documentary. Um yeah, and go swill said what I said. Um, sorry, uh, of how things go. I'm sorry, I'm starting to lose my train of thought here. There's a lot of questions coming up. Sorry, reset. Um, document, uh, documentaries, right? Because I did a lot of digging into the valor and the horror. If you don't know what that is, look it up. So it really ruined me to documentaries because they can be put forward for all kinds of reasons that have nothing to do with the historical record. And the history is, history is usually pretty bad. It's it's about you know selling your documentary. It's about making the money. It's not about telling the correct history. It's not even. It's about telling a story that'll sell. Um, it's it's it really bugs me in that way. So I tend to stay away from them. To be completely honest with you, you know this is where we get to the end of these live streams. Is where the truth comes out. I'm just not a big fan of documentaries. Period. I mean there are some really good ones, but to me those are few and far between. Um, it's just not much. Uh, some of it is. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it really depends. Uh, it depends what you also mean by counting, but also who's doing it. Um, it's a lot of it is. Uh, a lot of it's just counting of the time, right? I, I make a joke uh, that, you know, because I mostly do, or I used to do mostly army research, is armies exist not, they don't really exist to fight war. I feel like they exist to make paperwork because that's good for us historians, right? That we get access to this stuff nowadays. Some of it's still under lock and key, which makes no sense, but neither here nor there. Is, you know, keeping track of people is a huge thing, right? Because these guys are moving across the Atlantic. They're moving across the channel. I mean, it's 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 absolutely wild uh, how much is going on. So a lot of it is, is just accounting. But it, if you know what you're doing, and it, it takes some time to learn this skill. And I definitely stumbled and failed and made mistakes and still do. Um, if you know what you're doing... It just takes practice, but you can cut through it and get the stuff. Um, yeah, so it's it's um, it's a lot of that, and it is what it is, basically at this point. <laughs> what do you do to flush the brain of all the nasty data you have to view and plow through? Not much, to be honest. Um, I do this pretty much nonstop. Um, I don't have hobbies anymore. <laughs> This is my hobby. It's my job, and it's my hobby. Um, yeah, this is what I do. So, I mean, flush out. We, uh, me and my wife, we have our dog now. Good old Muggins. He's downstairs, probably causing some chaos, um, as he does. Uh, so he helps definitely now. We've only had him about five months now, so it's it's helped definitely helped because he's funny and goofy and a puppy. So we usually just watch brainless television because uh, we're both so busy. My wife is a lawyer. And she's lots, she's super busy, particularly at the beginning of years is always busy time for her. So we just tend to zonk out, watch YouTube or fluff. <laughs> so that's pretty much what we do. And just right back at it. And I usually read before bed. Like this is how I read these guys. I read these stuff before bed. So I'm doing this stuff all day long. Yeah, I mean, we just have interviews left now. And uh, there's some issues with interviews I can maybe talk about another time, but. A lot of them are not a fan of because they try to steer people in weird directions. And then, it, it, and Woody's at World War II TV has talked about this at length because he had he's met so many veterans in his time as a tour guide. I'm sure well, Colin's gone, but Colin as well. Um, you know how they met these guys and all this stuff. And there's lots of problems with interviews, but uh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, obviously, I agree, James. But 
not to toot your own horn, my own horn, but it's just this is what academics do. We dig through and try to cut through stuff and try to bring a critical eye. And that was the biggest thing was for me here is switching, doing that commemorative thing. And, you know, what he says, the two hats. I like that analogy, especially because he's a hat guy. You know, you have your analytical hat and then you can have your emotional or commemorative hat. I try to say commemorative because that emotional is used for negative connotations. Uh, anyway, so it's uh, it, it, that was the harder part for me is, is moving past the academic stuff sometimes. But it has its role and we need to dig through some of this stuff and, and cut through basically the BS and the lies. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, not a lot of money. I mean, 500 at the time isn't... Uh, uh, is nothing to shake at, but uh, yeah, it's uh, especially at the time, especially after the depression. I mean, it's go money went further than it does today, obviously back then, but it's still not a lot. It's not the life, right? How do you you can't value a life like that? It's just so difficult. Yeah, so uh, yeah, hobby not really. I watch sports sometimes. <laughs> a hockey, baseball, a hockey, football fan mostly now. Dealers and Montreal Canadiens. Anyway. Uh, thanks for those watching overseas. I really appreciate it um, and all the support. Yeah, so this is a tough topic. And again, I recommend both these books. You can still easily get Conduct on Becoming Online, Murder at the Abbey, not so much. So you probably have to dig through your library system or you know your friendly neighborhood librarian. Shout out to Norma. Um, is, uh, can help you there. So take a look. These are not easy books. I'm not going to lie. They are hard. Um, it was hard to get through some nights to read these stuff because I don't really read during the day because I'm working uh, on other stuff. Um, the Campbell book was hard. I'm not going to lie. It, it's a thin one. It's little. Stories are heartbreaking. And I've heard them before and it still breaks my heart. Anyway, so yeah, thanks for those who tuned in from overseas. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, Canadian government, you yeah, know, governments have to do that in some ways. Um, but yeah, it's it's a tough topic. It's one that's fraught with controversy. It's one full of, with neo-Nazis and things that come out of the woodwork. Uh, luckily, nobody found us now because we're going to wrap up here in a minute. Uh, but I'm sure they'll come afterwards. So that's one thing I could use help with. I'll probably just delete them if it's outright outrageous Naziness, which happened. But comments afterwards, like once this is done, comments um, um, is uh, very helpful. And also helping the, the channel, liking helps, commenting helps immensely. Um, I definitely need some help. Um, <laughs> Bruins fan. I guess I'll allow it. Um, I guess I'll allow it. Ugh, Boston. Um, anyway, yeah, so... I will do that. So yeah, so any help you can get getting this out, if you could share this also afterwards. Um, yeah, it, it, if you could, that would be helpful. I have another live stream coming tomorrow morning, bright and early, 9.30, looking at um, war cemetery caretakers who were taking care of the First World War cemeteries in France who stayed after the 1940 and worked with the resistance and stuff. With, with, with Caitlin DeAngelis. It should be really interesting. She's been working on this for a long time and I'm really interested in doing that. So that's, it's uh, 9.30 tomorrow, our time. So, but if you can't make it live, you can watch it uh, later words. And if people have questions, they can just shoot them to me. Uh, but yeah, so, if, and also one thing too, I, I need more help with things like Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. We got one tonight with um, Ghost Wheel. So thank you very much for that. And Super Chats and all that stuff is so helpful. Uh, for the Normandy project coming up where I can go to the ground and tell the story of the Abbey at the Abbey. Fill in the holes of kind of places. 9.30 a.m., not p.m. Maybe it's early in the morning. That's what, that's the only time Caitlin could come. And I wanted to give her the outlet to do it. And you can always watch it later. <laughs> Beauty of the internet. Um, anyway, so I can tell these holes in the story, the holes, right? It's been covered in Margolian, but I've never seen it talked about on YouTube or, and things like that. It's just hard to do. So that's what I'm going to do. So any help in that area is greatly appreciated. Other than that, thank you everyone for hanging out. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, thank you for all of this and all the thoughts and inputs on the sidebar. Always appreciate it. You guys are an amazing community. I'm so glad to have you guys and be part of this, um, especially for a hard discussion. Um, so much hard discussions. And yeah, and Mike G, I agree. That's an outstanding, excellent book. Um, get it, read it. 
take it in, probably be prepared to cry. Uh, but other than that, get both of these books if you can get your hands on them, read them, dig into it, and, and try to remember these lessons. So other than that, thanks everyone for hanging out, and uh, I'll see some of you tomorrow morning. Have a good night, everybody.